I think we have been, uh, human beings have been pretty good at going places where we didn't originally evolve to live. You know, at any given time, there's a million people airborne right now. Okay, I mean, we are not flying creatures, yet a million people at any given time, right now at this very second, are airborne. So if you ask me the question, you know, where are human beings going to be 50 years from now, I believe a large number of them will not be on Earth. And, and who knows how this is going to transpire, but the combination today of vastly reduced costs and uh, uh, is allowing the uh, uh, smaller teams to, to move rapidly uh, on space, space projects. And I think this is going, there's going to be a cascading effect of this to the point where human beings are going to be living, working, and uh, doing business throughout the solar system, not just here in Earth. So in terms of what we'd like you to see over the next 50 years, uh, I am concerned that actually people are getting heavier and those population trends are likely to continue because it's very easy to gain weight when in your environment you're constantly exposed to food that is highly palatable, that is very cheap, uh, and actually has a lot of calories in it. And so we're already seeing that in populations around the world, when they become urbanized and they have more access to food, people gain weight really over about 20 years. So I suspect that in 50 years time, populations that currently don't have a problem with obesity will have a problem with obesity. And in many Western part of the world where people are getting heavier, that will continue to be an issue, particularly also for children. One of the most important things I think that, that we're going to be known for is refashioning the way that science itself works um, because it's long overdue. And the key thing is we're still operating, we're still doing science using technologies from the 17th century in terms of how we present our findings, the, the sort of form in which we write up our findings, and then the technology, we write journal articles that are still published in journals um, that people then read to learn about what's being done. And that was a system that was developed when you had a very small number of, um, of scientists working in the, in the world. We've had sort of exponential growth ever since then in the number of scientists and in the amount of scientific output that's being produced. And we're, we're, we're doing science on a scale that is no longer really compatible with the way that we try to distribute scientific information. So we've got to find a way to change that. And, uh, and I think that's going to be one of the really important things that our generation ends up doing. And I think that in the next 50 years, uh, we will start to build large libraries of how chemistry interacts with our body, how natural products are changing uh, our biology. We're coupled with those since billions of years. How new molecules can be designed compatible in a genomic scale, reducing or even sometimes deleting of targets. So we're getting in a field uh, where probably you can call it programmable biology or the ability to deterministically change uh, your biology with endogenous molecules that are very softly touching the right points. And this is an exciting field where tons of colleagues and the smartest people in the world are working. And if I really have to be, I mean, it's hard to forecast 50 years because you're, I will always fail. But we might be in a world where we will know so much of the chemistry that we have, where the secret sauce, or let's say where the business in a way, or the innovation will not be anymore in the chemistry, but in the prescription like picking the right chemicals specifically for you at a specific time, reprogramming some of the events that went wrong, readjusting or rebooting your immune system at the right time. And the chemicals will be maybe an open source, a large database and knowledge for everyone. And doctors will become these biology software engineers where I will take a specific broken pathway or a disease and I will reprogram smoothly your biology to get it away. And that's, um, that's a pretty good future, I think. Uh, I think what is really shifting is an understanding that uh, technologies like synthetic biology um, can enable us to design and fabricate materials that have incredible properties, but also materials that um, are inherently more sustainable. And so we have an opportunity to rethink the fashion system, not just from a a cultural point of view, what do we want fashion to do for us, for example, but also uh, from a materials point of view, how do we consume uh, and 
reappropriate those materials into systems where we aren't generating waste and we aren't generating chemical pollution. So for example, um, what happens if you can work with a microbe that produces pigment uh, to dye textiles? Uh, and we've been doing a lot of work with a Streptomyces sedicolor around this very question, uh, understanding that actually the, the minute you bring biology into a system like that, it is more efficient uh, using less energy and no chemicals um, and a very small amount of water to do the same job that uh, petroleum-based materials uh, would have done or chemicals would have done. The current subject that interests me, I'm, I'm always interested in, in computation, but I believe we are in a huge transition equivalent to the transition that happened after what we call the digital revolution happened after World War II. So effectively 50, 60, 70 years ago, we suddenly took all this analog equipment that was left over after World War II and repurposed it in a very new way to make digital computers. And, and now the world is absolutely different than anyone would have predicted at the end of World War II. And I think we're doing exactly the same thing now. We're taking this you know, incomprehensible uh, wealth of digital components and we're putting them together. We're actually building analog computers. I don't know why people don't, won't talk about that. So I think in 50 years, we're going to look back and say we, right now, we're on the, in the middle of this analog revolution that's going to change everything as profoundly as the digital revolution. Now, to explain how that, how things will change, uh, that's difficult, but we're going to have uh, computation that just, just works in completely different ways than digital. And digital will stay there, but it will be a layer underneath uh, something completely different, much more organic and living. So the big vector I see right now is that biology, uh, which I think is molecular nanotechnology that just works, uh, is becoming programmable. So we're starting to be able to build living products using biology. And biology is this incredible technology that works from molecule level up to make incredibly complex things like squirrels, which you don't think about as technology, but are actually really, really incredible, right? They're autonomous. They can go up and down trees. Um, they have all these great features. And at the end of their useful life, they're totally home compostable, right? They're naturally compatible. So over the next 50 years, I see a lot of the materials first, things like plastics and foams, and then later on products, things like even computers and iPhones being replaced by biological equivalents. Uh, I think this is gonna both give us better properties and better features as consumers, and I think it's also gonna be way better for the planet. One of the great things about using nature or natural technology to, to build materials is that we've had like three and a half to four billion years of concurrent evolution to figure out what molecules can stay cycled on Earth. And systems have been built. For instance, lignin in trees used to be a problem. For a long time, all the coal we burn was just trees that were dying and piling up on Earth and was creating issues, in fact, with atmospheric gas balances. So nature let fungi evolve, which can break down things like lignin and cellulose. So nature builds from a limited set of molecules, but by controlling their structure, you get a vast array of properties. But those molecules we know are proven to go in our oceans and become food for fish, go in our forests and help rebuild topsoil. And if they end up inside a living organism, they're a nutrient, not a pollutant. And so by focusing on a natural toolkit and natural technology, you inherently get a benefit of sustainability. I think that what we now come to realize is that the current challenges or, or, or towards health or towards healthy aging is actually much more systemic problems, right? So I think that we will see less of this siloing in medicine, but really more of the system approaches. And that fit also with this idea of, well, if you maintain health, then actually you have to address a lot of different systems across the board. And with that, you will prevent a lot of different diseases, right? So there's a lot of, um, overlap if you look at the, the, the causes of uh, cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, even some cancers in what brings those about. And so by actually focusing much more on the um, prevention and maintenance, I think we will uh, cover a lot of those. But that, that will require a rethinking and also a retraining of, of course, the, the uh, people working in, in the field of medicine. Well, my field being journalism, basically communication, I think we've moved 
progressively away from the old model of uh, an authority model where the best, the best shorthand is Walter Cronkite in the United States who in the 20th century signed off his broadcasts. That's the way it is. And, and the New York Times front page, I wrote for the New York Times in different capacities for 20 years. That was your authority. And so we all looked at the same few talking heads on TV and we all read newspapers and had sort of this common feed. And now, of course, uh, it's an information buffet. Everyone can go out there and very efficiently get the information that suits preconceptions. So if you're a journalist, what do you do in an environment like that where you have so much noise and people in bubbles? Uh, and the way I've been articulating that is uh, we have to shift to uh, less a sort of authority mode to, uh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm sort of like a seasoned mountain guide after an avalanche. Hey, everybody, <laughs> I've been looking at these issues for a long time. I can't guarantee you I can get us off the mountain, but if you follow me, you probably have a better outcome than if you just sort of wander around. <laughs> so, so it's more of a guide to information and less about the individual stories. You know, I started blogging when I was at the Times in 2007, and that form really attracted me as a way to uh, create uh, journalism as a journey, literally as a journey, as opposed to a series of discrete knowledge points. There's so much data out there on uh, global trends, forests, uh, fisheries, you can, satellites are tracking fishing. And, and journalism has actually got competition now. I've, I know scientists who recently published papers that have revealed things that, that normally the New York Times or BBC should have revealed about subsidies uh, for fishing fleets go, re, plundering the deep sea. Uh, uh, Enrique Sala recently, and so and there 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 are lots of innovators working on even better ways to use uh, algorithms to track bad behavior and and make sure it's it's exposed. And a lot of that's not necessarily journalism, and, and that to me is a big opportunity. It's a threat to journalism as we know it, but it's a big opportunity for the world, uh, for citizens to actually play more of a role or emerging entrepreneurs to be the truth tellers. Mm -hmm.